Hi there, I'm Rebecca Hales and I'm Content Design Lead for Workplace for Meta. I'm going to talk to you today about content design and road trips and serendipity and all of that good stuff. So road trips for me hit that holiday sweet spot. That perfect combination of nerdy planning, spreadsheets, Trello boards, research, only to then get behind the wheel and really throw it all out of the window. I love it. The road trip somehow embodies what I tend to be professionally, which is a planner, someone who's quite good in a crisis, and what I am personally, which is just a incomplete human who's just trying to make the next best decision. And that's why I wanted to talk about my career in content leadership and road trips and the opportunities for serendipity that both present. In uh, 2012, I drove clockwise around the USA with my best friend before accepting a job at the Government Digital Service, GDS. I was heading up communications for a major transformation programme, the gov.uk website and 25 transformational services that went along with that. Four years later, in 2016, I drove anti-clockwise around America with my new husband. Um, and during that trip, I made the decision to leave GDS and focus on leading people instead of programmes, moving to the UK Parliament to head up a content design and social media team. I'm not claiming that road trips can be life-changing, but they certainly gave me the headspace to think about making some pretty career-defining decisions. First, quitting print media to move into tech, and then quitting communications to move into content design. Both happy accidents that led to me establishing one of the UK's biggest private sector content design teams over at BT, and now having the privilege to lead on the future of content design in the metaverse um, for the world of work over at Meta. So there are four lessons in serendipity that I want to share today. So the first one is let go of Barack Obama which is all about interpreting developments in your environment and flexing with them. The second is accept that all dogs are not good dogs, which is about building trust in relationships. The third is manifest a suitcase full of kittens, which is about communicating a compelling image of the future. And the fourth, build your own spam museum, which is about coming up with new ways of doing things. So, let go of Barack Obama. As we approached New Orleans in September 2012, after eight and a half hours of driving through uh, the swooping interstates of Mississippi and along the Louisiana coastline, we arrived at the edge of the city. We were planning to see Barack Obama give a pre-election speech, but as we arrived in New Orleans, it was an absolute car park. No traffic was moving and no one was coming in or out. It turned out that hosting the incumbent president um, and a New Orleans Saints game at the Superdome at the same time, and it being two weeks after a hurricane that displaced lots of people in the city, there was absolutely no room for us. All motels were booked, all restaurants were full, and all the roads were static. We were idiots. We'd focused only on chasing down Barack Obama, but hadn't considered the bigger picture. So we had to let him go, except that this time round, Barack Obama was not to be, and New Orleans was not for us. This kind of sense-making is essential in leadership. Organisational psychologist Carl Week describes it as making sense of the world in the same way that a cartographer would. He says that what we map as leaders depends on where we look, uh, what we focus on, and what aspects of the terrain we want to represent to our teams. Since all these choices shape the kind of map produced, there is no perfect map. And for me, sense-making is really about active analysis of the world around you. In this instance, my analysis led us to get creative. We went to Baton Rouge instead um, and made the most of it by listening to the president's speech on local radio. As head of content design and SEO at BT, this looked like working with 10 content design managers and numerous product owners to review the product vision regularly allocating content design headcount based not on short-term business need, but on longer-term priorities and the available skill sets that we had within our team. This moved us from being a content design delivery function to being a more strategic function and able to place people where the great work would be. Now, as a content design leader, you should determine what would be a useful map for your team, given that your particular goals might be one thing and you might want the organisation to do something else you need to adequately represent that in the map that you give them. 
be ready to make sense of the world around you and update that map as soon as new information comes to light. You can uh, engage in sense making by getting data from multiple sources, and this might be users, suppliers, employers, competitors, other departments or investors. You can uh, use um, get others involved in your sense making as well. This means uh, say what you think and check with people who might have different perspectives. You could reuse your early observations to shape small experiments. So on a road trip, you might drive five miles in the wrong direction before deciding to change your course. And at work, this might mean testing your conclusions and looking for ways to articulate alternatives. And you can go beyond existing frameworks. So just because you've told them your mates you're going to see Barack Obama doesn't mean you have to stick to that plan. You can be open to new possibilities. The next step is to accept that all dogs are not good dogs. So there was a point on that first road trip about 1300 miles from Illinois and 1300 miles from California in New Mexico that I looked at our map and chose a route through Glen Rio, an abandoned ghost town. We arrived uh, and there was a motel that was overgrown and it looked charming, a perfect opportunity to get some rather bleak looking photographs. So we stepped out of the car and looked around. I did spot some small black and yellow signs that said private property. They looked much newer than the ransacked buildings around us. And I did say to my friend, stay close to the car. As soon as I opened my mouth, a group of barking dogs rounded the corner of the motel. And I am an animal lover, and normally I would have thought, oh, cute, but these dogs were not stopping. We piled back in the car, slammed the doors behind us, and then within moments we were surrounded by a pack of barking, howling, jumping guard dogs. And we had about 10 seconds to think about our fates whilst the dogs decided to eat the front of the hire car. They started ripping chunks out of the wheels and the bumper. I tried to lure the dogs away out of the passenger side window, just throwing Haribo, trying to give some positive reinforcement. My friend, however, ran down her window and screamed, bad dogs, bad dogs, rev the engine and sped out of there. We ran up that road in the car, being chased by dogs. One by one, they peeled off and eventually we were okay. Now, without my friend's actions, I might well still be in a ghost town in New Mexico, negotiating with a pack of angry dogs, trying to make them see that I wasn't a threat. Content design leaders attempt to foster trust, optimism, consensus, and they can sometimes meet anger and cynicism instead. And that's not because you've done anything wrong, but it's because people see the world in different ways. I think it's a fair generalisation to say that content designers are towards collaboration, working in the open, and we know that building trusted relationships is needed for effective content collaboration. But building these relationships isn't easy. When I worked for the UK Parliament, I'd been promoted from content lead to head of content design and social media. My remit had broadened uh, and had a lot of new stakeholders to woo. This included a new to the organisation interim director of digital services. And I did all the usual stuff. I listened with the aim of understanding his thoughts. I advocated for my team and I presented arguments with data um, in an objective way, trying not to be defensive. But this didn't work. We still clashed. He wanted to make short term impact in his interim role by delivering a microsite. I wanted to build for longer term impact, looking at initiatives that would improve readability and accessibility across the existing website. We reached a complete impasse. I had expected senior leaders to want to build trusting relationships because that had been my experience so far. But no, I had to take a moment and accept that this dog was not a good dog. And I felt like I needed a team to bundle me into a car and get me out of there before I got bitten. But that wasn't an option. Instead, I turned to my support network. Building and maintaining a professional connection, set of connections, is an investment in your content leadership skills because no one person can possibly have all of the answers or indeed know all the right questions to ask. Lara Hogan calls this a manager Voltron in her amazing book, Resilient Management. If you haven't read it all yet, yet get a copy. Um, 
So to get agreement to move forward on this, I had to tap into my network of people who could help fill the gaps and convince that director of an alternate approach, my approach. I realised that it didn't need to be me specifically who changed his mind. It just needed to be someone I had a trusted partnership with. In this case, a pincer movement between the head of design and the head of engineering and the three of us playing on the pressure. So yeah, not all god the dogs are good dogs. Um, and having a relationship with this network of peers that you can call on to like throw a squeaky toy for you occasionally is really useful. You can build your network by taking time to understand other people's perspectives and listening without an with an open mind and without judgment. You can also encourage others to voice their opinions and find out what they care about and uh, interpret what they're talking about in sensitive ways. You can anticipate how others will react to your ideas and how think about how you might best explain them um, and just give the bottom line and explain the reasoning for your processes. And you should assess the strength of your current connections. Look at that management Voltron and find out who's filling different roles for you. The next lesson is manifest a suitcase full of kittens. Dead easy. So imagine uh, a scene in Wyoming and I've spent the day touring sulfur pools and mud volcanoes and geysers at Yellowstone Park. My husband and I are standing in front of Old Faithful, waiting for it to blow, and the sky is flashing with like lightning and rumbling with thunder. And when the rain starts, it's not rain, it's snow, heavy snow, blizzard in fact. So it closes mountain passes and it means that we cannot get to the Alpine Motel that we have booked for the night. And I was envisioning this beautiful hotel and I saw on the website that it had like embroidered blankets with uh, wolves howling at the moon on the fabrics. And I was like, we are so excited to stay here. But it wasn't gonna happen. We were stuck on the wrong side of a national park with snow halfway up our tires. So I had to phone the National Park Service and they were able to send us to the only accommodation available within the park a log cabin that used to be a ranger's hut. So my husband says not to worry and he's sure that the hut will be just as cosy as the motel, maybe with a TV and a bearskin rug and a fire. But we arrive at the cabin and it's dark and it's cold and it's got a single camp bed and nothing else. Well, it's all a bit depressing, but we love the suitcase inside and I pop back out to the car to get a torch. When I return, I find my husband standing in front of the suitcase and the suitcase is now full of kittens. Apparently he was looking for his warmest pair of socks and through the open door to the cabin, a mother cat just started bringing her kittens in and depositing them one by one into the suitcase. My husband had wanted to be warm and entertained in this cabin and somehow he had manifested a suitcase full of kittens from the universe. So you may not have that same superpower, but you can set the conditions for change. And as a content design leader, you can manifest the focus and energy needed to make stuff happen. Visioning is all about creating compelling images of the future. While sense making is all about producing a map um, and working out where you are now, visioning is all about where you could be and where you want your content team to be in the future. It's about giving people a sense of meaning behind their work. At BT, I wanted to get people excited about the vision of the future, user-centred content design that really amazes our customers. So I ran workshops with individuals from all of the tech disciplines to ensure that any design principles that we came up with would be understood and applied by anybody working in that space of user experience. We workshopped ideas around what it meant to be a BT customer. Uh, and answered questions like, what do we want our users to experience and how do we want our users to feel? Through multiple rounds of critique and socialisation with everyone from new starters through to the CDO, we emerged with a set of living, breathing principles that were high enough level to be able to set that vision um, and inspirational for people to want to work against, but also could be used as a bit of a criteria by which to measure the success of our endeavours. Now, content design leaders who are skilled at envisioning are able to get people excited about that future picture um, whilst inviting others to help crystallise how you get there. If other people aren't buying into that vision, you can't simply repeat it again and again. That's not going to stick. You really need to engage in a dialogue um, about the reality that you hope your vision is going to produce.
it's an excuse to move away from the plain English of content design and start using metaphors and paint a more vivid picture of the world that you want to build. And you don't have a comprehensive plan to get there, and that's fine. But other people, if they find that vision credible, will start generating themselves those ideas to make it real. So to create a compelling vision, you can practice it in different areas of your home life. Ask yourself what it is that you want to do and what it is you want to create. You could uh, develop a vision based on something you're really inspired by. Your enthusiasm will then in turn inspire others. You can listen to what they find exciting and important about it and adjust your vision accordingly. You need to accept that not everybody's gonna share your passion and be prepared to explain why people should care about your vision and what can be achieved through it. And then just be okay with leaving the how to the team. Don't worry if you don't know exactly how to accomplish the vision. If it's compelling and credible, other people will find ways to make it real that you couldn't have imagined on your own. So my last lesson is build your own spam museum. Can you think of a point in your content career where you worked on something a little bit unusual, uh, not strictly central to your role, or maybe something that you initially got involved with as a favour, but actually became a thing? Maybe you were sceptical and then learned something amazing and it was brilliant to be involved with after all. Weirdly, that's how I feel about the Spam Museum in Minnesota and about a project to photograph 650 MPs being sworn in to bring a cohesive modern feel to the imagery on the UK Parliament website. In both instances, I approach that with a little bit of fear. I don't like Spam, but I do love roadside attractions. I don't like MPs, but I do love providing citizens with open source images that are up to date. So the Spam Museum pictured here is, I swear, the happiest place in America. It's really small on size, but big on fun and information. We pulled over in the car and within minutes we were learning about the history of tinned meat on um, the American culture. Um, and we were given a tour by a guide known as a Spam Ambassador. Spam Ambassador. A 12,000 mile trip, and I still think about the word spam ambassador as like one of the highlights. Anyway, the same goes for the MP Portraits products project. It was masterminded by my head of content design at the time, who wanted to humanise the public figures behind the politics running our country. I was responsible for connecting her vision to the everyday reality of business in the House of Commons. So to do this, I needed to devise processes um, that bring that vision to life. Inventing a simple consent process by pair writing with parliamentary lawyers or finding a different way to document names and titles and attach that data to the photographs taken or simply figuring out physically how to move 650 new MPs through a photo studio during the opening of Parliament without interrupting parliamentary proceedings or getting in the way of their press engagements. All of this had to move us from this idea of the abstract vision into the practicalities of execution. To do it, we couldn't do things the same way we'd done before. I we used to be able to get permission from the House of Commons for every photo taken on parliamentary property. That would have slowed us down. We needed to invent new ways of organising. In the end, we managed to photograph 90% of MPs over two days, shooting more than 15,000 photographs, with each sitting lasting less than a minute, moving people through one after the other. Now, the inventors of the Spam Museum couldn't rely on their elderly declining population of Spam in lovers to maintain footfall at their museum site. Instead, they invented new experiences and processes like interactive games for children where they can measure their height in cans of spam or twice weekly online immersive tours. And I believe in your content leadership career, you will make some of the biggest impact in those most ambiguous spaces by inventing new ways of doing things, by building your own spam museum. So to cultivate inventiveness, you need to not assume that just because things are done a certain way, that's always the best way to do things. And when a new change effort or task emerges, encourage creative ways of getting it done. Experiment with different ways of organising work and find alternative methods for grouping and linking people within that work. And when working to understand your current environment, ask yourself what other options are possible. It's not always 
the status quo that wins out. Sense making and building relationships and setting a vision and inventing new ways of working, they're all interdependent. Without sense making, there's no common view of reality um, and where to start. Without the relationships, you'll just be working in isolation. And without the vision, there's no shared direction. And without invention, the vision just remains a vision. So no content design leader is going to excel brilliantly in every single one of those areas in equal measure. Yes, we are expected to have the capacity to make complex decisions and have the imaginative powers to paint a picture of the future that generates enthusiasm amongst our peers and senior leadership and the ICs on the ground. But we're also expected to have operational know-how and translate content strategy into concrete plans and get buy-in on those content undertakings um, that they could come with a big risk and you might fail. No single person can live up to all of those standards in my view. The complete and flawless content design leader is a myth. No one's got it all figured out and the sooner we stop trying to have the perfect career path and be all things to all people, the better off we'll be. The great thing is organisations are becoming more and more collaborative and work, remote working tools and things like Lead With Tempo allow us to get information from diverse backgrounds and loads of people and bring that into the workplace where we may not have had that before. So no one person is actually expected to stay on top of everything. That would be exhausting. It would kind of be like doggedly arriving in Utah and sticking to your planned route that you mapped while sitting in your bedroom in London, when in front of you, the man at the gas station is telling you that there's been a landslide in Zion Canyon and you just simply can't take that road. You wouldn't press on. You'd change your approach. You'd take on that knowledge. Others have knowledge that you don't. And once you accept that, you also realise that it's OK to use your network to fill in the gaps. And it's okay to change your route and rely on others and embrace a little bit of serendipity. Thank you.